So as we heard a little while ago, education is changing. It's opening up. It's giving opportunities to the people who aren't in a place, who can't pay those fees. And our next speaker is one of those who are leading this revolution in learning. It's often called flip learning. And she's a computer science professor at Stanford, an expert in machine learning, but she's also the co-founder of a business that launched a year ago called Coursera. Please could you welcome from California, Daphne Kohler. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Or maybe I should do this. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm going to tell you today, and where's my first slide? OK. Uh, I'm going to tell you today about the work that we've been doing for the past year on opening up education um, to provide everyone around the world with education without limits. Um, this experiment started out in the fall of 2011 with the grand idea that Stanford had to take three courses that, had, uh, that were advanced courses in computer science and open them up for everyone around the world to take for free. We were expecting an enrollment of a few thousand people in these courses, um, the largest of which at Stanford has an enrollment of 400. But within a matter of weeks, each of those courses had an enrollment of 100,000 students or more. Now, to clarify the magnitude of that number, in order to reach that same enrollment, to reach that same size audience, that Stanford course would have to be taught for 250 years. And by doing so, we would reach 250 generations of very privileged Stanford students, as opposed to the students from every age group, every country, and every walk of life that were able to have access to this material by virtue of making it open to the world. This really opened up, in, up to us the opportunity to take what has been until then a very, uh, an education open only to a privileged few um, and provide it at effectively a zero marginal cost per student, closer to zero dollars than to one dollar. And to do that, we took and opened this up as, as a Stanford spin out now called Coursera, um, which now has 3.8 million students around the world in every single country. Uh, we have um, 81 university partners that are offering over 300 and actually 84 courses um, to people in every one of those countries around the world. So let me talk a little bit about that. These are the US-based institutions that are partnering with, with us. And you can see some of the country's finest institutions, um, Stanford, Michigan, Penn, Princeton were the first ones. But there's also Caltech and Yale and Columbia and Chicago and many others. Uh, but we're not a US-based organization. Uh, there's also many of the world's finest academic institutions in Europe, in Asia, in Latin America, Australia, and Canada that are all working with us to provide um, an amazing education to people, allowing us at this point to offer courses in no fewer than six different languages, English, French, Spanish, Chinese, Italian, and German, and more coming up very soon. You can see. Um, institutions as diverse as University of Tokyo, Ecole Polytechnique, University of Edinburgh, and many others. Let me talk a little bit about the students, and I can spend hours talking about students whose lives have been completely transformed by giving, having been given access to an education that they would never have otherwise had. This is Raoul. Raoul is from Peru, um, wanted to study computer science, not much of that to be had in Peru took a, a bunch of the computer science courses on the Coursera platform, um, used that as the basis for his Fulbright application, and is now coming to study as a Fulbright scholar in the United <coughs> States. This is just one example. There's many, many others. I'll do another one in a little bit. Um, let me talk a little bit about the course itself, the course experience. What do these online classes look like? In constructing them, we try to move away from static courseware, where people are just accessing the course whenever they want, and there's no real structure to it. Here, it's like a college class. Course begins on a given day. Every week, there's um, material the students are responsible for learning. Every week, there's homework the students are responsible for doing. The homework is graded, and the students get that grade. And if you don't get enough good grades, you don't pass the course. You can see the impact of that intervention by this usage graph, where the x-axis is time and the y-axis is number of students on site. And you see that heartbeat pattern just before those lines? That's the day before the deadline. <laughs> Every week, the day before the deadline, people log in to do their homework, which should remind you of what uh, classes look like on our college campuses, showing that procrastination really is a universal phenomenon. <laughs> 
And then at the very end, there is a credential that the students can earn, and that really helps them potentially open the door to a better life, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Let me talk a little bit about the courses. We started out in three, using three computer science courses. We now have courses across the range of disciplines. There's courses in the humanities, in business, in medicine, social sciences, literature, art, music, including performance music. Pretty much any topic that you would want to learn is now available for people to take for free. Um, so now let's drill into uh, what these courses look like on the inside. So, um, first of all, there's the video component where the material is actually taught. But importantly, people don't like to just sit there for even for a matter of 15 minutes to watch videos. They get tired of it. And so we've tried to make the lectures interaction. So let's see an example of what that looks like. Um, there is sound, but I'm not playing it. You can see this is one example of our lectures. The, there's instruction going. But even in these short videos, the video hits the yellow notch and the student gets asked a question, answers the question, gets immediate feedback as to whether they're right or wrong, given an opportunity to try again. Now, this is the kind of question that as an instructor you might ask in a regular classroom. But in a large lecture class, when I ask a question of my students, 80% of them are still scribbling the last thing I said. The ones in the back row with their laptop open, they're on Facebook. <laughs> and then there's the smarty pants in the front row who blurts out the answer before anyone else has even realized that a question had been asked. <laughs> And then the class moves on. Here, every single student engages with the material. Now, um, this, um, the example that I showed was just one example of the kind of interaction that you can do in a video format. Nice thing about video is it really allows you to break away from the shackles of what you can do within a classroom and innovate in terms of the format. And so people have done some remarkably innovative things in terms of how they present their material. I'm just going to give two of many examples. On the left is the Illinois sustainability class where they wanted to demonstrate sustainability issues in the field. So they literally took the class into the field to show them how these things manifested. On the right, the introduction to sociology class from Princeton, where the instructor, in addition to the weekly lecture material, also had a weekly discussion group with 10 students selected from different countries in, around the world. And the nice thing is that because sociology is so contextualized, there was an amazing diversity of perspectives represented in each of those discussions, to the point that Mitch Denier, the professor, says he learned more from teaching his one class his, his class once to a global audience than he had from 12 years of teaching it at Princeton. Because at Princeton, there's always a great discussion every year, but it's always pretty much the same discussion. And here, he learned an incredible amount about different perspectives that's now influencing and shaping his understanding of his own discipline. Now, the second component of the student experience is the interaction with, um, with the material itself. So I already showed you that even within the lectures th that exists, but, um, but the really meaningful interaction happens when students have to engage deeply with the material and really solve problems. And so how do you, solve, how do you grade the work of 100,000 students if you don't have 5,000 teaching assistants? Um, one pest possibility is to get a computer to do the grading. Um, and it turns out that computers can now grade a fairly broad range of topics, including not just multiple choice, but also short answers and math and all sorts of other things. Nice thing about computer grading is that it's not only scalable, it's also immediate. And that turns out to be absolutely critical as a pedagogical tool. Because in traditional instruction, a matter of weeks typically elapse between the time that the students learn the material and the time that they, are, they receive their graded homework back to find out that they didn't get it. And that's too late for them at that point to go back and relearn it properly. Here, the feedback is immediate. And you already saw that in some of the examples. And that means that for this generation especially, it turns into a computer game. They try it. They get 60 out of 100, and they say, darn it, I could do better than that. And so they try again. And you can see that in the graph over here, where the blue bars is the initial score distribution for an assignment, and the green bars are the final score distribution for that same assignment. And see that everyone gets close to a perfect, close to perfect score. Now, is that just random trial and error? Do they actually learn something from this? Well, our analytics show that students who exhibit this mastery-based learning actually perform better, not just on that particular assignment, but also down the line on future assignments as well as on the final exam, um, even if you correct for initial cognitive ability. And so this really does help student outcomes. The second place where um, we have done uh, grading at scale is intended to deal with a kind of creative 
innovative problems that you cannot really grade using a computer. And for that, we've put in place what we call a peer grading pipeline, where students are given instructions by the instructor on how to grade the work of their peers, are trained in that application, and then go and grade the work of other students. And it turns out that that has um, several important benefits. First, it's actually a remarkable learning experience for students to have to think critically about the work of their peers, having just tackled that problem themselves, and compare how different solutions may get you to different outcomes. And that really is a, a critical component to teaching creativity. The other part is that you can really now do at-scale grading for the kinds of things that you would never have thought you could do in a class of this size. For example, this is from the um, Wharton Business School design class where they really did a range of amazing projects, getting feedback from fellow students at every week of, of the design process um, that really helped shape and refine their design. The final aspect of the student experience is the community that gets constructed around this. And we currently have over 2,900 groups that meet around the world once a week, um, just naturally congregating to talk about the material and help each other over the hard bits. One such group that I'd like to highlight because it's really interesting is this group from Ohio. Um, and the reason I like to highlight it is because it's a group that you wouldn't naturally have thought would succeed. It's a group of women, mostly in their 40s and 50s, from a very poor town. Only one of them has a college of education. Uh, and has a college education. Most of them are either on a fixed or low income. Got together, picked a Darden Business School MBA level class, took it together under the supervision of a woman called Sharon Watkins, and ten of them started the class. Nine of them completed it, and six passed an MBA level course. And now one at least is going to become an entrepreneur on her own right by taking this class. The final piece of the student experience is the certificate or credential that they get at the end. Um, and so let me talk a little bit about that. This is an option. You don't have to get it. Uh, but if you want, you can sign up for the class in an identity verified mode where your real world identity is verified using a government issued picture ID. We set up a biometric profile that in fact uses keystrokes. It turns out that we each type a little bit differently. And so once we have that, we can identify you when you come and log into the platform. And so we can confirm that you are actually there doing the work and therefore able to give you a meaningful credential at the end that you can present to other people. Now, one thing that's interesting about this that really helps, I think, to address some of the criticisms that have been uh, laid against these massive open online courses is it speaks to the issue of completion. People will tell you that only 8% of people who, complete, who begin a MOOC complete a MOOC, which is true. What they don't tell you is that only a very small fraction of the people who begin a MOOC actually intend to take it for real. Most people are treating it as a browsing experience, kind of like leafing through a book. People who sign up for signature track, however, do so with the intent to complete. So let's make that comparison. 8% of people who begin a MOOC complete it. 74% of people who sign up for signature track complete the MOOC. Of the people who sign up and say they're highly committed, 83% um, of the people who sign up and say they're highly com com committed complete a MOOC, and 93% of those on signature track do. So that's a very high completion rate for an online class. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about um, how this might improve human learning. Um, the first is, we talked about big data as an enormous opportunity. Well, this is huge data because we measure every single event that the student does, where they pause a video, rewind, look at a forum post, submit a quiz, every single thing is measured. So it really tells you what's working and what's not. So here's one example of how you could use that. This is a distribution of wrong answers from one of the assignments. Each little cross is a one-off wrong answer. That big cross in the top left, 2,000 people who made the exact same mistake. You can really learn from that what's working and what's not. And now every single student who makes that same mistake gets told not just that they're wrong, but also how they might go about for fixing their misconception. Um, that opens up the door to, uh, I think, a really remarkable opportunity uh, based on a paper by Benjamin Bloom, who studied the distribution of achievement scores in three populations. Lecture-based, lecture-based with mastery learning, we already talked about mastery learning, and lecture and individual tutoring. And you can see that each one of these gives a full standard deviation of improvement in performance relative to the other. Well, the nice thing is that now we can use technology to help us go from a lecture-based model to mastery learning, and maybe big data will allow us to get close to individual tutoring. 
So I'm actually going to um, finish with this. Um, the other place where we can help it is the following. This is one of my favorite quotes. Um, and college is a place for a professor. <laughs> and so maybe, instead of doing this, we can do this. Have really high quality online content where students achieve mastery, practice the basic skills, really get the material, and then come into class to learn all of those creative things that employers are currently telling us we're not teaching our students. Creative problem solving, understanding the material in depth, active learning, and so on, that um, are currently not there for our students. Thank you very much.